This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Hey there, everybody. I hope you're well. Thanks so much for joining me. I've got a conversation with Jonas Rensky from the outfit Catatonia to share with you. The catalyst for our chat is due to an Australian tour, which the band are embarking on throughout February 2024. I believe it's their fourth across our wide brown land. Can't wait to see them, actually. Now, throughout the chat, we talk about getting back into tour mode after years of layover due to COVID, the Catatonia sound, the recent album, Sky Void of the Stars. How has that been received? And then those of you who know the show know what I'm like. I'll go into a lot of depth about the early days with some of these Swedish and Sweet Death Originals and Jonas definitely qualifies on that front so expect plenty of banter about the early days of the Stockholm and Gothenburg music scene. So here he is, Jonas Rensky from Catatonia. Jonas. Yes. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, mate. How's the uh the old Zuma grind? How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's going fine. It's uh it's just uh no problems. How have you found the transition over the years? You've been doing this as long as anybody from face to face, I suppose, and tape recorder, then phone, and as new territories started opening up, and then of course there's Skype and now we're Zoom. Do you do you enjoy doing these sorts of things this way or do you prefer face to face? I think I still prefer face to face, but I think this is a good uh you know, middle road. It's it's fine. I'd rather do this than do email interviews because they tend to get a bit tedious after a while. So it's I'll easier to just talk. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more. I actually, I actually don't do them. And there's, I've, <laughs> yeah, because I just don't see the point. To be honest, with you. it's just no. I still get a few of them, but you know, I'd rather do just a bit of talking, and that's easier. Mm. Well, especially with a history as long as yours and the impact that the bands had and your work across Bloodbath and, of course, Catatonia as well. There's so many great things to ask you about. That's why these things are so good now. Yeah. Hmm. So you are touring Australia in February of next year. Now, I think it's your fourth tour, if I'm not mistaken. So as Australia, is it a highlight on the tour schedule or just another series of shows, so to speak? No, we really love going uh, going over because it's uh, you know it's it's a place that when we visited for the first time, uh, it wasn't until kind of late in our career because it's I mean it's not a place that you can go to if you have a limited kind of uh, budget or whatever. It's such mm-hmm. a far off uh, place to to travel to, and but once we started to come over, it's always a place that we look forward to. To come back to because it's uh i mean it involves a bit of traveling uh but once you come there it's it's uh it's definitely worth it because it's such a welcoming and warm uh place and the, the hospitality is always great so it's and the crowds are great so it's it's a perfect place to visit especially when we have our winter time uh to go over and, and get some nice weather it's I like that. <laughs> yeah, I can can relate in some ways. Yeah, it's the opposite for us. I like going to some of the colder places because it's always so hot where I'm at. Yeah. But which which city is your favorite? Do you think? Uh, I re I'm really fond of Melbourne uh, because I mean, crowd wise, I can't say really that one is better than the other. But I I really like Melbourne because of the I don't know. It's, it's just certain vibe that I get there. Um, but I like all of them. It's it's not a big difference for me. Uh, except that Perth is a bit far away, so you have to travel for like five, mm. six hours on a plane. Uh, but, um, you know, I love all of them. Brisbane is, is fantastic too, and Sydney, of course. Mm. Yeah, I'll certainly be at the Brisbane show, but how, how is it for you getting back into touring mode after a few years of the layover with COVID? I mean, I think everyone uh, in the band, which could, we just couldn't wait to get back on tour. It's... You know, it's normally what we do, uh, and having that taken away from us was, uh, you know, it was kind of a shocker, you know, in the beginning. Um, 
so just being able to be back on the road is it's uh, it's great and especially with a new album uh as well with you so it's i couldn't be happier actually to to be back on the road mm, yeah how, how has the album been received sky void of the stars it's outstanding and it's got some very flattering praise from blabbermouth and kerrang but do you feel like it's connected with your your core audience Definitely, yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, every time you you release a new album, you think for yourself, you know, this is the best we could do at the time. Um, I was super happy with the album when it was done, but then of course it's the the when the real release comes and and people start get into it and and you start touring for it. That's when you see, you know, if it was a success or not. And I have to say, this album has been received very well from the as you say the core audience is you know they seem to be very much into it and um i'm super happy with that because i'm into it too so it's it's uh it's a perfect album to to go on tour with uh there's a mm. lot of songs on there that which are very lively i think for for being us at least mm. uh so it's uh we have we're in a really good place at the moment i would say with this album and and the tour scheduling coming up so it's um, I would be more worried if we didn't have any tours <laughs> in the yeah. pipeline, you know. So it's, uh, I think it's successful enough for us. Mm. Your, your new albums are, are on point, but you've never, you're one of those bands that's never really had a down moment. You've never had a stinker, so to speak, as far as the fans are concerned. <laughs> I think you've got 12 albums or 13 out there, but there's a heap of releases, split albums and EPs, this sort of thing. And I distinctly recall when Discouraged Ones was released, and I love that album. But it does beg the question, with so many releases, how on earth do you conjure a set list? Oh, it's one of the most difficult things we have to deal with these days after mm. COVID. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, we, we for every gig, we only have, so much time that we can spend on a set list. I mean, we, we don't want to play overplay, you know, our welcome. Mm. So, um, it's challenging, but I think we know from playing live, uh, which songs are staples that we, we just have to play. And mm. then we try to take in different songs from different albums. Of course, obviously when you have a new album, you want to play some songs of that as well. And during a tour, if we have, taken in a song that we haven't played for a while and we realize, oh, well, maybe that was the reason because people don't seem to get into it as quick as with some of the other songs. We just swap it for something else. Mm. So the set list is, you know, it's kind of alive all the time. Uh, we don't set it in stone. I mean, we have a set list and, but as I said, if there's something that feels awkward, we will just replace it with something else. Mm. Uh, and during a long tour, that's also nice for us because it's um, changing things up a little bit and make makes us a bit on our toes, you know, to keep that yeah. vibe going as well. Well, with so many songs to choose from, how do you rehearse for a for a tour? Then do you just pick the songs you know for a fact you're going to be playing and just not so much hammer them into shape, but become familiar with them again? Yeah, we do that, but mostly it's. I mean, we do play live most of the year uh and we always have like a set list that's the most recent one and those songs mm. we we still have sort of in in you know our backbone uh so for a tour we we mainly concentrate on songs that we haven't played for a while that we're going to play because when we do summer festivals we play like 50 or 60 minutes but a headlining tour requires at least 90 minutes so there's going to be songs that we have to bring in and and we sort of focus on those uh, also mm -hmm. a few extra songs so that we can you know swap around things and stuff like that so that when we rehearse there's uh there's a lot of songs to play and uh we sort of hammer them in and, and uh but not the more the, the ones that we recently played we, we just put aside for a bit yeah yeah no, i get it yeah well, the other thing is that your voice is, it may be the distinctive element of the catatonia sound. It's the one thing that you can, you think of first, well, I do anyway, when I think of the band's sound. So how do you take care of your vocal health, especially when you're doing those long tours and you're in aircraft for 16 hours at a time? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
it's hard to to keep it fully in shape. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Say if we're doing like a seven week tour, I know it's at some point it's going to deteriorate a little bit. But I try to sleep uh, and drink water. That's my main thing mm. to get my hours of sleep and not uh, go around and being thirsty and sweaty all the time and just sort of rehydrate. Um, because that's, to me, you know, that's what helps me the most. Uh, I'm not drinking tea or stuff like that. Um, maybe I have a bit of ginger now and again, right. but, um, and also try, you know, warm it up a little bit before the shows, but I'm not a really, uh, I don't do any like vocal, uh, you know, those kind of, uh, things that real <laughs> singers, as I call them. <laughs> That they're doing um but we have a playlist that we play one hour before we go on show uh go on stage every night uh with favorite songs of of us in the band and we just sing along and you know try to get in the the mood so mm. that that's helping to to warm up the voice uh but i would say sleep and water that's the best the best thing yeah sleep and water but i, I remember having this conversation with nick uh, a few years ago now six or seven years ago now but he uh I mistakenly assumed that Paradise Lost uh, abstained from alcohol on the road, and he politely said, "No, we don't. We love to partake." <laughs> so, oh yeah. But, but being a vocalist, how, how do you avoid the the traps of having you know a few bevies and just enjoying yourself after a show when you've got to get on a plane at five or six o'clock the next morning to go to the next bloody show? Uh, well, I mean. I'm like Nick. I like to have a glass or two, especially after a show when you you feel like, you know, that was a good show and you want to just wind down. And mm. uh, if we have a super early morning, then maybe I'm I'm not doing the, the all nighter, you know. <laughs> uh, but on a tour, on a long tour, when you have a bus like that, you can you, I mean, you can pretty much sleep how much you want. Uh, mm. But it's the flight thing, as you say, if you have an, an early flight like we're going to have in Australia for every day. I guess, um, then you just have to stick with a couple of glasses of wine and then go to bed. Mm, yeah. And I'm going to cast your mind back a few decades now. So when, when the band started in Stockholm in the early 90s, when there was just so much killer music coming out of Sweden, it really heavy metal rebirthed through bands from Stockholm and, and Gothenburg, I believe. So do you recall if there were any key rivalries with your mates in the Co Gothenburg bands at all, like, you know, a city versus city thing, like a Sydney versus Melbourne thing? Well, I think it was a little bit like that. I mean, we weren't really involved because we weren't sounding like hmm. either the Stockholm bands or the Gothenburg bands. Uh, mainly, I think most bands were friends, even from the different cities. Uh, but of course, the... The scenes were a little bit different, especially within the death metal uh, thing, where the, the the Gothenburg bands, they had more of a melodic approach. They were all very inspired by Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And the Stockholm mm. scene was a little bit more brutal, I think, with bands like Entombed and Dismember. Dismember, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so maybe there was a little bit of rivalry within that, but mostly I think people were, you know, friendly enough with each other. Uh, there were a few bands that were the whole sort of Swedish scene, and they were both from Stockholm and Gothenburg, so they sort of kept it together, I think. Hmm. That's a good point you raise about the death metal versus melodic thing, because most of the bands around you in Stockholm back then, they were concentrating on brutality, speed, and precision to an extent, but Catatonia is all about mood, and it gave you a lane almost all to yourselves. Now, that's my take at least and do you agree with that yeah definitely um i feel that we stood out pretty early on because we mm. didn't do that entombed whatever thing uh i mean we loved entombed uh but we quickly quickly realized that we were not that kind of players we just started playing on our, our instruments and they were already really good at what they were doing so it was easier for us to concentrate on you know uh emotional uh as much as emotional as you could be in within the death metal realm uh but we were very inspired by paradise lost there's no uh hiding in that you know uh, and once they released their second album gothic we felt like wow this mm -hmm. is the way to go for us as well you know uh it was such an important album for us and and we just took it from there not trying to copy them but you, you know being inspired and then also finding 
our own identity within that kind of uh, narrow little scene that they created. Um, and I think we we succeeded um, because we we don't really sound like each other today, but we still have the same kind of roots. I would say. Hey, what are some? What's a prominent memory of the vibe that was in the scene back in those early days? I think for me, especially, it was the the gigs that happened. You know, the very small gigs, uh, maybe two hundred people. Uh, it felt like because I just got into this scene and it felt it just opened up my eyes to something that I never been part of before. It felt like you were in a secret society kind of, uh, because I had no, uh, there were no friends of mine in my school and stuff like that, that listened to this kind of music. And once I started doing it, like, you know, the death metal thing, I felt super special. And once you would see like flyers in the record store, there's a show happening bands like at the gates or even grotesque as they were called before and then entombed tiamat those kind of bands and you would mm. go to this show and there's 200 people there and they're all exactly like yourself you know very devoted very into this sub genre of a subculture you know yeah so it felt mm. very special because it it had at the time there was a, a very uh welcoming vibe also in this death metal um, scene. So it was great. I mean, I look back on it with very fond memories. Um, mm. But the live shows really show that, you know, I'm part of this as well. You know, this is my thing. Mm. You, you've been in a band with Dan Swano and you certainly had albums produced by him, but he seems like he's, the you know, there's five degrees of separation of Kevin Bacon or whatever it is in Hollywood. It's a bit like that in the Swedish scene with Dan Swano. So do you feel like he was the the fella, the bloke that was at the centre of helping shape not a particular sound like the Seattle sound, but allowing every band to sound like the way that they wanted to and then in a way he passed that baton to uh, Fred, Frederick Nordstrom? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, we worked with Dan from the very beginning. Uh, I mean, he did our demo when he had just an eight track studio way back. Uh, and he was always so um, encouraging and helpful. And, and I guess also that's why all the bands that he did, why they came to him, because he was, uh, it never felt like he was tired or he was like, you know, I've done this now for a while. I'm not you know, interested yeah. anymore. He was always taking, I guess, every project, you know, as a completely new start and, and just do whatever he could to, to make it sound really cool. And, and yeah, when he stopped doing that for a while, I think, yeah, Frederick maybe took over, uh, because he was starting doing really cool stuff in the Fredman studio. Uh, as I think especially when he was doing some early Inflame stuff and, and also the mm. Slaughter of the Soul album, you know, people started oh, going to yeah. so that studio. Um, but we also had the Sunlight Studio in, here in Stockholm with Thomas Skogsberg. He was, he was also, I mean, big part of shaping the sound, especially early on with, with Entombed and Carnage, Dismember, those kind of bands. He created the whole Stockholm sound with, with his studio. So it's... There have been a few, you know, institutions in, in Swedish metal, especially the underground mm. thing. Uh, and I'm happy to have been part of, of a couple of them, you know, uh, and seeing my band being, you know, benefit from, from different kind of uh, mixers or producers or whatever. So it was a, a good vibe. Mm. Norway had a very important and very prominent niche with black metal. But I feel like the Swedish bands went, they just loved heavy metal, so they went death metal, gothic metal, doom metal, the whole thing. It was all a part of it. And of course, I know there are some Norwegian bands that did that too, but I'm talking about a lot of them. And there are a lot of great bands that came out of Sweden in the early 90s. We've already talked about a lot of them, including you guys. My view is that without the Swedish scene being as strong as what it was, heavy metal wouldn't have emerged the way it did post year 2000 we've seen bands like kill switch engage then come along after you got so the big influence on the american scene and over here in australia and and the british scene as well but 
Do you, do you feel the same way? Do you feel like as if if it wasn't for the Swedish musicians, the Swedish bands, that heavy metal may not have emerged from? And the key point here is the the, the doldrums, if you like, that was happening in the nineties, when heavy metal and even rock music was declared dead by shithead magazines like the Rolling Stone. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, I, I think Swedish, the scene that we had uh, for a long time as well, you know, starting with a really deep underground thing and, and also rising up, uh, it probably shaped a lot of, of today's metal uh, bands that are huge today. Um, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's because also Swedish bands did not just create something, but they also, you know, sort of developed something else. I mean, if you listen to Entomb, they they were, uh, when they released their first album, it was total death metal album and they got huge uh, uh, with this record within the, the underground scene. But then, of course, they, they started doing this death and roll thing that was also mm. unheard of before they started doing it. So th- a few important bands have probably shaped a lot of stuff that's going around, going on today. Uh, I would mention at the gates also, of course. Uh, mm. So, yeah, I hope you're right, at least, you know, I would feel really good if Sweden had, you know, an influence like that, because as you said, that the metal thing was declared dead and gone, but it, it was just shifting and, and starting over in the shadows of the, the underground. And then it came back. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that's the case because I'm 45 and I was a young fella back in the in the early 90s and I distinctly recall reading Terrorizer and Metal Maniacs in particular. Both of those magazines were, were legit in my view. Yeah. And outside of the fanzines and Slayer Mag and a few others, of course. But those two, you could buy them in a key point here, you could buy them in railway station news agents. So it was you could they were readily available. That's a key thing. You didn't have to sort of find a a metal shop which would almost not exist in Australia back in those days. But they were released, you get four or five months after they were released, you get a copy over here and they're talking about the Swedish bands, you guys and all the others. And and it just felt like there was this huge renaissance happening through the fingers of guitarists in Swedish guitarists. And you, you, you've even seen Michael Amott, who's a, obviously sweet. I know his father's English, but uh, in Carcass as well. And I think Carcass really do deserve a lot of credit for really taking heavy metal by the balls through um, Heartwork and those other great albums when they moved from being a grind band as well and some of the influence that I think that they may have inadvertently had on the Swedish scene there as well. But, yeah, man, it's uh, just to round out the point, I just thank God for the Swedish bands in that era there. There were so many great bands that came out, but, you know, there was Cradle of Filth too and the magnificent black metal bands that we saw coming out of Norway and uh, it just gave young fellas like me, mate, uh, something to really sort of cling on to when bands like Iron Maiden and Metallica really lost their way. Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. Um, it was something that just took over uh, from what, you know, Priest and Maiden and those bands did mm. and created something new by still being influenced by their old heroes, but, you know, just making things more extreme. Um yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on at the time, and I'm I'm very grateful for you know have been a small part of it, but also involved as a fan as well, you know, and and being just like you, you know, picking up magazines and and because mm-hmm. back then that was the only source of information mm-hmm. you had, like, and I, also as you said, you you wouldn't get maybe the the magazine until it was had been released for a couple of months already mm. and you would re- read like oh there's a new album coming out but by the time you read that the album was already out it's not like today you can you know see on someone's instagram oh we're releasing a new album in two years you know i'm writing for it now but then it was like holy fuck there's a new morbid angel album coming out <laughs> and then you realize oh i already have it <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days well. Yeah, I just did distinctly recall when Formula's Fatal to the Flesh came out, and that but that happening, they're on the cover of more of uh, Metal Maniacs, and 
was a couple of months old and it's like shit i've been listening to this for a while in, in a way yeah. it was good because you get the album and then you'd read the interview as opposed to read the interview and wonder what the music sounded like but yeah true yeah I, i'm a bit nostalgic for those old days i must say it was it was a time when the true believers had to invest in the bands and pay 35 dollars australian because it was up to that much unbelievably at the time oh yeah yeah, uh, for a CD. So you really had to take a chance and be sure that what you were doing, especially if you only had a hundred dollars to spend on recreational activities that week, or even less, a lot less. Yeah, exactly. Most of the time, you had to believe in the band. Yeah, and even if I mean, I remember buying albums that I thought was was shit uh, when I first per- put it on for the first time. But I mean, since you spent that money and you maybe didn't have money to buy another album. You had to listen to it over and over again until it became, you know, decent and maybe mm. eventually also good, you know, because there was nothing else to do. You couldn't just play it on Spotify like today and say, oh, this is not for me. So maybe we're missing out on a lot of great music. But, you know, I feel like I've done my part in that. I've been listening to a lot of records that I thought initially was not for me. And then mm. now I love them. So. <laughs> Same. Don't worry. There was plenty of junk back then as there is now, but there's also plenty oh, yeah. of fantastic stuff. Don't worry. And uh, so so what about, have, have you got a method for determining what songs you say for Catatonia or transversely give to Bloodbath? Not really, no. When I've been writing for Bloodbath, it's a completely different thing. I mean, Catatonia is something that's very ongoing uh, all the time. That's what I focus on. But at the times when we have decided, oh, we 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 need to do another bloodbath album it's just like okay i'm gonna write three four songs maybe and then i just concentrate on that until i'm done with it but the catatonia is an you know it's a floating process that's just always there until it's time to record so it's mm-hmm. totally different and i like to have it that way because uh you know catatonia is the my own philosophy and my my main thing and i i think about it every day and you know i i think about the songs that i have you know going and how i could change it and then i sit down and do it and um it's like um my day job but Mm. actually one that i really love (laughs) doing um so it's it's different for for everything that i do basically i mean if i write something for for another project as well it's just something that i do mm. a certain time and but catatonia is the main thing the arrow of satan is is drawn is still an album that i listened to magnificent stuff was it was there anything that you recall being special about that album or is that just is that just me being a fan and just enjoying that one in particular i think when we did it because we had a, another guitarist coming in uh joachim carlson and he came a little bit from an from a different scene. He's more of a black metal guy, and he he has his main band Craft, which is a band that we loved as well. And and so we thought maybe you know that kind of influence will change also the way we write songs. And we wanted to to give the album sort of a a little bit more of a black metal aura around it, uh, not too much, but a little bit. Uh, and that's why it's different. And also the sound is maybe a little bit more murky uh on purpose uh of course but you know just sound a little bit more evil and i think we succeeded in that so mm. that's what's the goal at least um but then again i mean the next album would be totally different again which is the charm mm. i think with these kind of projects uh when you can just say oh man i missed the 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 Florida scene so much, the Morris Sound mm. bands, and just mm. like, oh, let's write a couple of songs in that style. Uh, whereas with Catatonia, you can't really do that. It's It would change too much from album to album or even in the same album. Um, but of course, then again, we always try to, to make Catatonia have different kinds of influences from time to time, but maybe not as drastic as as when you do death metal and you want to mm-hmm. fiddle between 90s florida and and then maybe some black metal you know it's a different thing mm. yeah you're right it, it's no surprise to see catatonia chart occasionally and 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 reach and climb up and, and beat the the all powerful and all pervasive rap and r&b and hip-hop albums that seem to be the media's darling these days but for bloodbath particularly on 
the arrow of Satan is drawn to achieve a top 50 in on the German charts. That's, that's really saying something about the strength of the album and how many people out there really, they do, they enjoy and they love exactly the sounds that you just articulated. Yeah, and I think with Bloodbath especially, because we started out as a tribute band to just the old days. And I guess there's a lot of people still that, you know, miss these days and, and what they get when they listen to Bloodbath is sort of a, uh, a package that's custom made for that kind of mindset. You know, it's it's our minds making the music that we are feeling nostalgic about. And if you buy it and you're a 90s death metal guy, you you will get it, you know. Mm. So that's the, the difference, I guess, uh, which is cool. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, and the Germans love their heavy metal. God, we know that. And it never, ever went away there, did it? No, no, it's... Uh, it's always been super strong. I mean, they, they, they're loyal. They wouldn't change their mind for anything. I think when it comes no. to metal music, no, great fans. Yeah. I'll make this my final question for you. I don't think I've asked this question before. So here we go. You, as I say, you said up top, you've been doing this as long as anybody. So how do you see the future of heavy metal and, and more particularly extreme metal evolving? Well, I think it's, uh, Right now, it's in a in a good place. Uh, there's a lot of bands coming out. Uh, I have to admit, I, I don't really keep track of everything that comes out. Uh, I wouldn't have time even, you know. Mm. But um, I, I can tell by, you know, playing festivals, um, even smaller festivals, new ones that you just see uh, maybe being held for the first time and you you don't know what to expect from it and once you oh sorry i have a cat stepping on my computer um yeah uh, no, no the problem don't worry i got two of them myself <laughs> <laughs> um but then you you when you come there and you see like what well, this place is full of people uh mm. and i've never been here before and and you know it just showcases that it's a strong scene still and it's probably getting stronger every every day um because a lot of young people come come around they'll tell tell their friends i mean it's the old school way of 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 dealing with it like i went to see this heavy metal band or or, or death metal band and you tell that to a friend that's never heard that kind of stuff they will probably get into it for a while at least and and they will tell their friends so it's uh i don't think it will go away it's it's here to stay because it's also an investment for people like i was saying in the beginning of this talk uh the feeling that you get when you find this place where you just feel like wow i belong here mm. um i'm not sure you can get it as strong in another music scene or, or style you know there's a uh, there's a mm. strong feeling of, of being part of something that's special. Yeah. I think you're spot on and I think you, you've hit in, you, you've nailed the point there and to round it out, I remember Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedy said something about 30 years ago where he said he'd never seen anything like death metal because everywhere he goes, he sees Morbid Angel t-shirts, this sort of thing, it doesn't matter whether it's South America, across the United States, Europe, this sort of thing, but it goes deeper than that. I get requests these days from people who manage bands in far-flung Iran and even Saudi Arabia. And these are extreme metal bands, death and black metal bands. And there might be hip hop bands there, could be, but I know for a fact these bands are thriving in these countries where you wouldn't think it would be possible, but there you go. It's an international language crossing. Extreme metal crosses all cultural, religious uh, language barriers, every barrier you, you can possibly think of, heavy metal manages to cross it. And it's just an amazing thing. Yeah, it will make its way, you know, to any place, and it it will find people there to to love it. You know, it's mm. uh, you, yeah, universal language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mate, it's been a great chat. Thank you very much. Good luck with the tour. I uh, hope to see you. Uh, well, don't, not hope to. I will see you down here, mate. I'll be in the audience. I'll raise a raise a glass in your honour when you when you're playing. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks a lot for doing this. Well, there he is. What did you think? I've spoken to so many of the greats from the Swedish music scene of late. Recently, that conversation with 
Michael Stanny from Dark Tranquility. That was a good one, but Jesper Stromblad, very notable. Jesper from In Flames. Check those out over at scarsandguitars.com. There's plenty more just like that available on the page. Search until your heart's content. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, because I've written a book, follow the links on the web page, the front page, as a matter of fact, to a marketplace of your choice. Download a sample, and if you like the book, and you complete the purchase, please hit me up, because I want to thank you in person. So that's it. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Thanks for listening. Until next time, it's a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words, uh, sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.